vast plain of Nogia is the cockpit of the Indian Empire. Countless battles have been fought for the possession of this barren land, the gateway to the riches of the south. At Delhi, excessive cities have been built by conquering invaders. Each has fallen into disuse and decay. But it's an ancient legend in the Hindustan that the ninth city will endure and will rule forever. These cities of the early conquerors are now a huddle of impressive ruins. Not until the Emperor Babarin swept down with the sword of Islam from the north did a foreign power become a force in Hindu India. For Humayun, the son of Babur, this tomb was built. The graceful architecture of the last and richest of the Mughal empires exercised a fascination upon India which will never lose its hold. The great Akbar followed Humayun, and around the ruins of his predecessors, his many victories for Allah are celebrated in dome and arch and graceful column. Here in this column is at once the loot of one great battle and the monument of yet another, a sacred pillar of the purest iron, wrought by some strange and undiscoverable method which has preserved it from the rust of centuries. The Kut Mina, the famous Tower of Victory, was begun by one and successively completed by the Mughal conquerors of Delhi. 238 feet of carved red sandstone. great mosque of the Mughals, the greatest in all India, center of the native city of Delhi of today, commemorates the vast Mohammedan invasion from Baluchistan. Long shallow pools are laid out for the ritual washing of the face and hands which every true Mohammedan must scrupulously perform before he is allowed to pray. In this great mosque and its forecourt, 20,000 people can assemble and give praise to Allah. beautiful but smaller is the Pearl Mosque, pinnacle of Mughal art in Delhi. Only a little less renowned than the famous Taj Mahal, built by the beauty-loving Shah Jahan as a memorial to his wife. Pacified by the victorious wars of Akbar, Delhi and the Hindustan now entered upon the richest period of their ancient culture under Akbar's son, the royal Shah Jahan. The Delhi of that time the era of the greatest Persian poets became enchanted by the love of beauty for itself alone. The palace of old Delhi was a throng with men and women of high caste. Such women as these adorned the palace gardens, the stamp of aristocracy upon their brows, the color of their robes ablaze against the dark green cypresses. Before it is put on, the Indian sari, the flowing robe of Indian women, is the most shapeless garment in the world. Each of them is nothing more than one straight length of silk, ten yards long and some two or three feet wide. But into one with its threads of silver and gold, deep hemmed with solid precious metal and fastened only on the right hip and on the left shoulder, it can be made to drape the figure in a manner to outmatch a Paris gown. The high caste Indian women wear upon their brows the blood red mark or puja of the Brahmins. Under Shah Jahan, who caused the marble of his palace walls to be inlaid with semi-precious stones, with sardonyx, cornelian, chalcedony and chrysopas, the pursuit of happiness came expressed in languor, enervating Hindustan until the highest form of living was to watch the changing shapeliness 
of passing clouds. But the ninth enduring Delhi had then yet to be erected. Combined British and Indian rule, a new Delhi has arisen. A Delhi which has kept and added to the beauty of the old, but without its dreamy lassitude. Connaught Place, the business centre of the modern Delhi, brings a new grace to the wilderness of northern India. The British, with their national love of lawns and flowers, have taught the Indians to lay out an entire the beauty once confined to tombs and temples and to palace gardens. British and Indians are cooperating to carve out a nobler future for this Delhi than was possible under a despotism. In this, the magnificent House of Assembly, British, Muslims and Hindus combine in governing. The spirit of the new and vital Delhi is externalized in a new style of architecture, deriving its inspiration not from one tradition but from two, molding the culture of two continents into a third. Where once water was a luxury and a profusion of it the prerogative of princes, there are giant fountains in the public squares. Neither Saracen nor British, the new Delhi is Neo-Indian, retaining the motives of old Delhi and dignifying them with a new austerity. Yet the lilting grace that made the beautiful, the almost effeminate pearl moss, has softened the austere geometry of modern architecture. The new Delhi is dynamic, but no less inspiring than the old. There was once only a burnt and acrid plain. There is a green and fertile land laid up with a prophetic eye to the increasing future of the capital of India, the ninth enduring city, which in the old legend of the Hindustan will stand and rule forever. ever.